Church of the Lakes, Pastor Mike, and I uh, hope, hope you had a great week. Uh, obviously, this is a great teaching, uh, or God wants to speak to us or something, because this is the third time we've tried to record it. Um, so that's why we're a little late getting it to you, but um, obviously God wants to speak. So man, just take a moment and then ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you today through what it is that God wants you to hear. Uh, let me tell you, we're really excited because we're very close to the possibility of a location. So please be in prayer for us uh, as far as that goes, as far as the location and wisdom. And if this particular place we're looking at right now is not the place for God to just slam the door shut, you know, if, if it's if it's really not what he wants. Uh, but if so, for him to open up. And so uh, just be in prayer. Uh, look forward to making an announcement real soon on that. But let's jump into our study for the week. And uh, we've been walking through Acts. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, we are now in Acts chapter 7. So grab your Bibles, open up to Acts chapter 7. Um, I have to go back into 6 a little bit because actually 6 and 7 are part of a narrative. And so I want to set the scene just a little bit by going back to 6 and remind you that in 6, the apostles had appointed seven men to uh, help with the widows. There were some widows that were getting left out. Uh, You remember they're kind of living in community and they're taking care of the widows. It's kind of an interesting side note. There's a difference between a widow and a widow indeed. If you study scripture, a widow was somebody who lost their husband but still had family around. And the scripture actually specifically says that their family is supposed to take care of them. But a widow indeed was someone who lost their husband, but did not have any family around. And the scripture says it is the church's responsibility to take care of the widow indeed. So they're dealing with the widows as a church. And and, uh, Stephen is one of the guys that gets appointed to help make sure that everybody gets what they need. Well, Stephen is a, a man of God. He's not just a soup kitchen worker. He knows his word. And he is performing literally miracles, it says in 6, that he performs miracles. He preaches. So obviously obviously the guy is spending his time uh, in the presence of God, in God's Word, in uh, just hearing through the Holy Spirit, being powered by the Holy Spirit, taking time to say, Holy Spirit, fill me, empower me to do what you have for me today. So he starts to preach, and along come some of the the, uh, religious leaders. And those religious leaders... They challenge him. Well, it says that they can't even match up to his wisdom. So obviously he's doing his homework. He's studying his word uh, and he's empowered by the Holy Spirit. And so then they bring some people along to, uh, bla- to, to, to basically make up some junk and say that he's blaspheming God. And so that's the scene when it opens up in seven is it says this. Then the high priest asked Stephen, are these accusations true? So in other words, somebody just stood up and said, oh, he's blaspheming God. And he's blaspheming our patriarchs and this and that. And so the, the high priest says, okay, well, Stephen, is this true? And he has his moment that he could defend himself. What's amazing is he does not defend himself. He goes into what is going to be a, a 50-something verse sermon. What's also amazing is that, sermon, uh, that, that Stephen is actually preaching his funeral sermon. He has no idea at the end of this, he's actually going to die. So this is his last chance to give a defense of, the, of his belief, of the faith that he has. And so he stands up and he begins to walk through a history of the Old Testament. Now, why would he go to the Old Testament? He's standing in front of the high priests, the religious leaders. They know all these stories, right? They, they, they've studied, they know them backwards and forwards. But he begins to point something out the whole way through the story. And as a side note, do you ever want to kind of have a summary of the Old Testament? Just read chapter seven. It's a great little summary of here's this Old Testament story in about 50 chapters, uh, 50 verses or so. But he starts to go through and he starts with Abraham and he starts talking about the story of Abraham. Well, of course, you know, these are patriarchs. These are their dads, literally their dads and their granddads. So uh, he starts telling the story of Abraham and he gets to a certain point in verse six And he says this, God also told him that his descendants would live in a foreign land where they would be oppressed. Stephen starts to take each one of the patriarchs, tell a little bit of their story, and then he starts to talk about rejection. The fact that they were sent by God to do this particular task, to play this role in God's story, but then they are rejected. So he goes on there and he starts talking about Joseph. He gets to the story of Joseph, and and in in verse 9, it says this, listen, 
these patriarchs, and he's referring to Joseph's brothers, who are the tribes of Israel, his brothers are, these patriarchs were jealous of their brother Joseph, and they sold him as a slave in Egypt. Again, hey guys, here's a patriarch. Here's how he was rejected. Here, here's a guy who was sent to fulfill a story that God has, but he was then rejected. He goes on to talk about Moses. And with Moses in verse 27, he says, But the man in the wrong pushed Moses aside. Who made you ruler and judge over us? So here's Moses, raised up in, in Pharaoh's house, sees one of his Hebrew brothers being abused, does something about it, but when he does, the other Hebrews reject him. Again, a story of God bringing someone along who has a part to play in God's story, and the rejection happens. He goes on to talk about David wanting to build the temple, but that really wasn't what he was supposed to do. So he builds this this narrative around the whole Old Testament story of God sending someone and the people rejecting. God sending someone and the people rejecting. God sending someone and the people rejecting. And then he gets to what is sort of the punchline, I guess, if you will, when you get to verse 51. It says, you stubborn people. Now he looks at them. He's talking directly. You are heathen at heart and deaf to the truth. Must you forever resist the Holy Spirit? That's what your ancestors did. And so do you. Name one prophet your ancestors didn't persecute. What Stephen has done is he has set up this scenario to talk to them and say, let's, let's go through the history. Abraham rejected. Moses rejected. Joseph rejected. David rejecting what God, what the Holy Spirit was leading and, and what was supposed to happen. So he walks through this whole story and basically, I mean, he's, he's bad-mouthing the patriarchs he's, in a sense um, because what he's saying is every time God tried to do something, all you people, all the, our nation, we rejected what God was doing. So two lessons I want us to pull out of today's uh, chapter. One is this. One is we got to go back to Stephen and remember, so here's a guy who's a soup kitchen worker, right? He, he, he's handing out bread. He's doing the thing with the widows. And yet, man, he knows his word. He's obviously filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, you don't get filled with the Holy Spirit uh, by doing nothing. You don't get filled with the Holy Spirit by being stagnant. You get filled with the Holy Spirit by spending time in God's presence, by worshiping, by spending time meditating on his word. And so he spent the, the time to do that. And, and because of that, he's filled with the Holy Spirit. He's performing miracles. The lesson there, I think, for us is that sometimes we can get to the point where our involvement in the church feels stagnant, maybe. Maybe you can get to the point where you can let holding a handing out bulletins at the front door as a greeter or changing uh, poopy diapers in the nursery, you know, or being an usher. And so and we can get to the point where that just becomes this. Well, I did my duty. I did my part in the church. And what I think Stephen shows us is that, yeah, you need to do your part. And those parts are critical to make the church function. On the other hand, you've got to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You've you got to be studying your word. You've got to be in the presence of God. And even beyond the work that you might do or the, the particular role you might play in the workings of the church, he means for you to do miracles. He means for you to do amazing things, for you to speak to your coworkers with such wisdom that they can't even understand. But that takes the work on our part. We need to be in our word. We need to be on our knees. We need to ask the Holy Spirit to fill us again each morning anew that we're empowered to do great things. The other lesson here is that we really don't want to be like the religious leaders and reject what the Holy Spirit is doing. It is so easy, and I, I can be just as just the same way. Um, it is so easy for us to look at a new move of the Holy Spirit or some fresh way that God might want to reach this next generation and reject it and reject what the Holy Spirit might be doing. And so, boy, how critical is it that we stay uh, in the presence of God, in prayer, and in tune with the Holy Spirit so that we don't become those churches that argue over the color of the carpet, that we don't become those churches that, that, that get our sacred cows and this is the way I like it. And why aren't we doing this style of music? And why don't we have this type of a building? And we should do this. And, and we start comparing with other ministries and people will say, oh, well, look at this ministry. They're doing it right. 
well, maybe they're doing it right for what the Holy Spirit's called them to do. We need to make sure that we're not resisting what the Holy Spirit is calling us to do. And so, man, let me challenge you this week to, to stop and ask God and say, God, am I spending the time with you that I should uh, to be that kind of man or woman that Stephen was? That he did what was maybe considered a menial role, but he was filled with your spirit and, and doing great things. And he was in tune with the Holy Spirit, so he wasn't rejecting what God was doing, the new move that he was doing. So let me challenge you with those two things, this, those two takeaways this week. Ask God to, to, to sort of check your heart uh, in those areas. And, and let me encourage you, man, even if it's a minute, take a minute, read your word in the morning, take a minute, talk to the Holy Spirit as you're driving, turn the radio off as you're driving to work and take that, those few minutes to, to say, all right, Holy Spirit, empower me today to do the work that you've called me to do. Help me not to resist what you're doing, but to move in you. Let me pray for you guys. Father God, thank you so much for your word that continues to challenge and teach. Uh, is a living book that we get to constantly, we can read the same story 20 times and get 20 different understandings of who you are. And so uh, thank you for, for teaching us. Thank you for guiding us. I ask God that you help us to be as diligent as Stephen and as bold as Stephen, empowered by your Holy Spirit to not resist what you're doing, but to walk right alongside with you. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Guys, have a great week. We love you. Talk to you real soon.